In this lesson, we'll be going over why we use DMA, also known as Direct Memory Access, and a rough idea on how we will use it. Additionally, we will go over how we use an interrupt with the UART port for receiving MIDI messages. Inside our STM32F411 microcontroller is a tiny part called a DMA controller. This part is also known as a peripheral inside the microcontroller. And it is completely independent from the core, which is like a CPU inside a computer. I like to imagine them as separate IC chips inside the STM32F411 microcontroller. DMA controllers are programmed at startup to transfer data from specified memory locations we call buffers to our desired designation such as SPI, UART, and many other peripherals. They can also be set up to trigger interrupts when they get to a halfway point or at the end of the memory buffer they are accessing. All of these actions can be done entirely without the core constantly instructing it to do so, thus freeing up the core to do other operations while the DMA is doing the menial task of moving data from memory to peripheral. If we didn't have a DMA controller, the core would have to stop what it was doing each time we wanted to move data from memory to the peripheral and do the transfers itself, then resume what it was doing such as crunching math functions that create data to place in the memory. This solo process would be very inefficient. When we use the DMA inside our microcontroller for our synthesizer, we are telling it to move data from the memory buffer to a peripheral called SPI, also known as the Serial Peripheral Interface. We use the SPI port to create our I2S audio interface along with a couple GPIO pins. The nice thing about using the HAL library is the I2S interface is simple to set up. It practically does all the work for us by combining the DMA controller's data fetching with the SPI port for streaming serial data along with GPIO pins used for the bit and word clocks and orchestrates them together so they all stay in proper sync. The series of instructions used to make all this happen are combined into a handful of functions called a driver, in our case the I2S driver. We will be getting into those functions in a later video when we begin to code our synthesizer. The section of memory we will point our DMA to read from will be called a buffer. This buffer is a region of memory that has a beginning address, specified amount of addresses to include in our buffer, and an ending address. We will specify this buffer memory size in our code with the I2S driver. The compiler will specify the actual addresses in the background for us. In the configuration setup, we will specify this buffer to be a circular buffer. And the buffer will be in an array we will name AudioBuff. A circular buffer is like a tape loop. It will start at the beginning, and when it reaches the end, it will start at the beginning again. The circular buffer is very handy for streaming audio data. While the DMA is streaming out half the buffer's data, the core can be filling in the other half with new data. This way we get a steady stream of data out. Ideally the core is filling up half the buffer up much faster than the DMA transfers the other half to the SPI port. We're talking about the core writing bits to memory at 100 megahertz versus the DMA transferring bits at 1 megahertz. But the more we ask the core to do, the slower it will be at filling the buffer back up. Eventually errors can happen if the core is overworked and the buffer can get garbage data that results in clicks that we've heard in previous videos. When the DMA is transferring data, it will eventually reach the halfway point of the buffer it is reading from. When it sends the last byte of data at the end of this half, it will raise a interrupt flag known as the transfer half complete. In our code, this will tell the core to start filling up the area of the buffer we just got done reading. Meanwhile, the DMA continues to stream out the second half of the buffer while the core fills in the first half. The core has to be fast enough to do this before the DMA reaches the end of the buffer because when DMA reaches the end of the buffer, it will raise a flag again. This time it will be the transfer complete interrupt 
and it will instruct the core to fill the second half of the buffer, while the DMA returns to the beginning of the buffer and stream out the first half again. This is why it's crucial the core can fill the buffer much faster than the DMA can read it. Since the core can fill half the buffer up before the DMA is done transferring its half, this gives it a chance to do other things either after it filled up the buffer or during its task of filling the buffer. This leads us to the second half of our lesson, the UART port and its interrupt. The UART is short for Universal Asynchronous Receive and Transmit Interface. It is a serial data port similar to the SPI port because it transmits and receives ones and zeros one at a time. SPI and UART are not the same protocol though. Our MIDI port is the UART port. Granted, we have the optocoupler circuit between the MIDI cable and our serial port for stray noise isolation purposes, but the same series of ones and zeros sent across the MIDI cable are the same as we see at the UART serial port. UART usually has a constant high signal on the port while it is idle. This is a standard practice to help us know we have a live connection to another device. When the device wants to send data, first it will set the signal low for a moment, then it will send the ones and zeros by switching the voltage between high and low as needed for each bit of data. When it is done, it will return to a steady high again. Without going into much further detail, what is important to know here is that when the signal goes low, we can make the UART trigger a interrupt service routine also known as ISR. The core will check if other interrupt service routines that are running have a higher or lower priority compared to the UART's priority. If another ISR has higher priority, the routine must wait until all higher priority ISRs have completed. Then it can have the core run its functions. But if there are no other ISRs running or they are all of lower priority, then the UART ISR can go ahead and have the core run its functions. What's important to see here is the UART's ISR will be set to high priority versus the DMA's ISRs. In fact, we'll be setting the DMA's ISR as low as possible. If we set the UART ISR lower than the DMA, we would almost never get a chance to service any incoming MIDI messages because the core is constantly working on filling the DMA's buffer. Granted, there will be moments when we might squeeze in a MIDI message, but we need to get those MIDI messages in just as soon as they are available and process them to update variables the core will be using to calculate the data it is filling the buffer with. Since we know the core can fill the buffer up much faster than the DMA can read it, we can be assured it won't be fatal to stop filling the buffer just long enough to fetch a byte of data from the UART's buffer, check what value it is, store it to a new location if valid, and if required, run a quick process to alter or update a variable such as a note on, a note off, a control change, or some other MIDI related control. After the core is done with the very small task of processing the incoming MIDI data byte, it will resume filling in the buffer if that's what it was doing before the UART ISR fired off. Now that we've covered the basics of how the DMA keeps a steady stream of data flowing to the digital analog converter and how the UART's ISR is used, we are ready to move on to actually configuring our microcontroller so it will be ready to start coding into a synthesizer.